Welcome to Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain. This edition has been funded with an educational grant from Pfizer Limited. Each year, over 5 million people in the United Kingdom develop chronic pain, but only two thirds will recover. Much more needs to be done to improve outcomes for patients. That was the stark announcement by the Chief Medical Officer for England in 2009. In response, the British Pain Society, in partnership with Dr Foster Intelligence Limited and funding by the Healthcare Quality Improvement Partnership, undertook a national audit of pain services. And their final report was published in December 2012. I went along to the launch of that report at the Science Museum in London. For those of you that uh, might not have met me yet, my name is uh, Richard Langford, I'm President of the British Pain Society and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event this evening on behalf of really the three organisations that have been involved in delivering the National Pain Audit. So welcome and thank you so much for coming this evening. It's the final report which encompasses the work which took place in two phases. The first phase being an evaluation of, an audit of, the disposition of pain services around the countries, uh, England and Wales. And the second phase was to recruit patients who were attending pain clinics for the first time, inquiring about their history and comorbidities and their incoming uh, pain scores, quality of life, etc and then following them up six months later to find out what treatments, broadly speaking, what treatments they'd had and broadly some of the outcomes. Why did we need a national pain audit? There was a reasonable amount of pain epidemiology in the press suggesting the sort of range of percentages of the general population that suffer with daily pain or chronic pain but we didn't have a great deal of information on where pain services were placed and their composition in terms of staffing in order to deal with the pain problem, which we recognised was quite significant with an estimated seven to eight million people living with pain in the United Kingdom. So we wanted to inquire about where the pain services were, what they looked like, and also there was very little information on how patients fared once they were referred to a, a pain clinic. So it was felt that uh, all of that would be useful and very particularly what triggered this national pain audit and indeed was uh, the impetus to the approval for the funding was the fact that it was suggested in the CMO's annual report in 2008. Chief Medical Officer. Chief Medical Officer, yes. I would like personally and on behalf of the community of patients in pain, uh, with people living with pain, some of whom are present with us today uh, representing patient organisations and um, people with pain, on behalf of them, on behalf of the British Pain Society and, and others, to thank those that were on the Scientific Advisory Committee, the Project Board and the Governance Committee. But I'd particularly like to draw attention to Dr Cathy Price, who was both uh, a leading author of the final report and also chaired the Scientific Advisory Committee, and Dr Stephen Ward, who chaired the Project Board itself, both of whom are here with me now. So with that, I'll hand over to Cathy. Thanks, Richard. Um, I haven't got quite such a loud voice as Richard, or maybe I have, but um, <laughs> maybe my kids will tell me otherwise. I just wanted to run through some quick highlights of the pain audit to represent what's happening in pain management in England and Wales as best we can. Successive reports from government uh, suggested that we didn't know how well pain services were doing. When people tried to find out a bit about them, it wasn't clear who they were seeing, how many of them were, there were, and uh, the outcomes from them. Patients didn't know how to find them, GPs didn't know how to find them, and so at the very least some sort of geography to the pain services was needed. Then the reports recommended that we also found out a lot more about them. What have you found out about them? There are quite a lot of them actually. The main things are that 
they seem to be seeing people who have a very poor quality of life, uh, much worse than if they had one single condition, so it suggests that people have got multiple health conditions. We found overall 161 different providers in England and Wales of those 214 different clinics. So some people are really scattered about. We also found that um, 28 primary care trusts in England didn't appear to have any pain services at all, and perhaps they were borrowing from other areas. So there was a great big variation in actual services. There was an even bigger variation in the type of services. Um, for pain services, the standard is multidisciplinary clinics. And uh, we found that in England, only 40% of clinics could truly call themselves multidisciplinary, a bit higher in Wales, about 60%. But that means that they're not really able to offer the full range of treatments nor get the most effective outcomes of care. So is your aim to name and shame <laughs> or to kick people into action? From my perspective, it's to highlight where there's variation to highlight where there is apparently less than good practice. It's then up to the people in those areas to decide what they want to do. But unless you name people, then probably nothing ever happens. We found that clinicians um, have been trying to get multidisciplinary services, and yet their voice has not been heard. We hope that the National Pain Audit will give that voice to them. Right, okay, we're not gonna name and shame. Where's the best place to have chronic pain in England and Wales? <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, it looks like somewhere around Gloucestershire and Ipswich are around some of the best services. So particularly the South West and uh, Suffolk area seem to do, be doing well with pain services, as does the um, far northeast of England. So those are the places to go if you hurt. <laughs> well, I suppose they could be, but we'd hope that the other services can get to their level. If patients and their GPs don't know about the services, where they are, who to refer to, what's on offer, and occasionally if they don't recognise the benefits that can be accrued from uh, referral, then there is a significant issue for patients. And I think we recognise both us as professionals and patients and the patient organisations recognise that there can be serious delays in the time to referral in the patient's journey from the first development of a serious pain problem through what was an, on one occasion in a separate survey found to be a seven year period during which the patient suffered their pain before they were referred to specialist pain services. And it's not unusual for these patients, this group of patients, to be sent from pillar to post. First of all, maybe with uh, what ultimately turn out to be, but very well intentioned, but turn out to be investigations, but necessary investigations, but they don't actually lead to anything that helps uh, a treatment that helps the pain. And also because patients in this group often have uh, complex problems, we talk about pain being a biopsychosocial phenomenon, so it has the biological aspect, the, uh, so the actual mechanisms of it, the anatomical damage, the pathology that may be responsible for it. But there's also the psychological impact on the pain and of pain on the person's psychological profile. In other words, they may well become depressed and anxious, they will potentially have sleep problems. All sorts of things affect their uh, mental health and similarly uh, mental health can indeed lead to chronic pain. So the two are inextricably linked. So there's the bio, psycho and social. The um, uh, terrible impact that this can have on relationships, on the family, on carers uh, and indeed of course the societal impact, uh, the costs but also, of course, for the individual, the impact on their ability to work or get back to work. So it's a very wide ranging problem that uh, our pain patients have. People reported that pain had the highest impact on work uh, out of all areas. So we absolutely need to take notice of that. Part of the problem is that um, it, by the time people come to pain services, they come too late and they've lost everything. We've started locally working with Ramploy uh, vocational rehabilitation specialists. They are going into local employers, um, trying to prevent people losing their jobs and finding new jobs for people 
This has been a new approach that pioneered in Southampton, mirroring some work done in Cardiff in the mental health services there. It's been very successful to date, and I'd encourage others to adopt that model. Other services have worked collaboratively with other vocational rehabilitation specialists, and they do see a difference. So one of our recommendations is that services need to do this. It would appear to me that if, if pain is a biopsychosocial disease, then if you don't address all three issues in your pain service, then it falls short. Absolutely. And for many people, who I think this is the confusion for many people um, in primary care population, people manage pain, they learn to manage it relatively well, and it's not troubling them too much. But when it starts cutting into their life significantly, it starts taking over and impacts what we, we found highest on work, then on activity, then on um, social life and friendships, overall mental well-being. Then when it's got to that level, then you can't just try and treat pain itself. You've got to look at the pain and its effects. And a biopsychosocial approach is really the gold standard for doing that. So unless you try and do that with this population, what we've shown is that indeed the population is that which has got multiple needs and yet services aren't, haven't got everything they need to be able to deliver fully effective care. It, it feels to me like many are struggling. Many people know what they should be doing, but it seems very hard to ask or to develop the need for that. We hope that the National Pain Audit will have at least highlighted that there is a need for a biopsychosocial approach within a multidisciplinary model. The fact that patients are being pushed from pillar to post does that mean that pain isn't viewed as the problem itself, just as a byproduct of something else? Well, I'd, I'd hate to generalise on that, but I think certainly on occasion we might interpret the patient's history and experience as one in which practitioners, again with, with all good intention, focus on the disease or what they think might be the cause with obviously good intention, with a desire to treat the root cause. But of course, if that isn't found to be genuinely the cause of the pain, or actually there isn't uh, an abnormality there, because pain can occur either long after the original condition has healed up, uh, such as shingles or uh, a surgery or trauma, or um, other conditions like a stroke or whatever, um, spinal cord damage, that that can lead to long-standing pain problems and the focus may be on the original disease or the ongoing disease, for example, diabetes, uh, without enough focus on the pain. So some people are very keen to see that pain is regarded as a condition in its own right. I think it is sometimes a condition in its own right. There is no uh, obvious remaining or maybe no cause ever that can be identified for it. That doesn't mean the pain isn't real, it's very real. Equally, there can be a condition that is ongoing where the pain is indeed a symptom, if you like, of, I'm a pain doctor, but it can be a symptom, if you like, of somebody else's disease, like a diabetologist, a diabetes doctor's disease. Absolutely, the diabetes has to be addressed, but the message I would like to get out is that whether we regard pain as a condition in its own right or not, pain should always be addressed in its own right that regardless of the patient's other conditions, pain needs to be addressed. And uh, while trying to improve the patient's um, physical or mental health, the pain itself needs to be treated. In fact, it's the most common reason for a patient to go and see a doctor. But mystifyingly, it's also pretty common that patients come away with everything being managed except the pain. I'm Christine Hughes, I'm the Secretary and a Trustee of Pain UK, an umbrella organisation that represents those charities for which pain is, is a significant part of the condition that they represent. Now you're here at the launch of the National Pain Audit Report tonight. Were you surprised at the paucity of pain management services throughout the UK? I wouldn't say I was surprised, Paul, because having worked in this field uh, now for, oh, seven or eight years I realized how poor they are but yes when I started I was shocked and I haven't seen a vast improvement over those six years I think there's more awareness and I think there's people working extraordinarily hard like the BPS and the CPPC to improve services and raise awareness but it's not happening fast enough for the number of people who, who do suffer appalling pain and who often aren't asked about it 
What do you think the next step should be for the report writers or the report publishers? The thing that is important is to be able to go nationwide, if you like, and the only way we're going to do that is if NICE do take up the quality standard and provide guidance. And then we will have a national standard that people could then hold up to commissioning bodies and ask them, you know, basic question, why aren't you providing this? And uh, so I think that is probably where this has to go. Now you're a volunteer for Pain UK, which is an umbrella organisation, if you like, covering people like Pain Concern. Yes, we've got 23 full member charities, which range from uh, quite big charities like Arthritis Care, right through to very small ones like Volvo Pain or Pelvic Pain, who are really almost you know one-man charities. Our average charity has, I must get this right, but I think it's 5.6 full-time members of staff. Um, but I think the majority of them actually have less than one full-time member of staff. So these are charities where people are working extremely hard, mainly using volunteers, and they can't hit all the buttons, which is why it's very important that we hit pain for them. I'm talking about things like, uh, you know, the Polio Federation. I'm talking about the Limbless Association. I'm talking about the Spinal Injury Association, as well as, you know, lupus and fibromyalgia and uh, the, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And these are all people who should be affected by the National Pain Audit Report. Yes, they should. It will help all of them. Even though most of these charities are fighting very hard for services for their particular condition. You know, if, you, if you've got endometriosis, you want somebody to be fighting for, for better understanding of that. But at the same time, there will be pain that will not be resolved just by treating the endometriosis. And for those people, these services these uh, that the pain audit has highlighted are really, really important. And that goes for every condition I've mentioned. You know, if you lose a limb through diabetes or an accident or whatever, you have phantom pain or you may have appalling post-operative pain and you need good pain services to deal with that. And that is not directly linked to not having a leg, which might be much more about having a, a, a you know a good uh, prosthesis than than anything else. So, yes, it's, it's something that, that overrides nearly every long-term condition, and we need both things running alongside good services for rare long-term conditions, as well as good pain services. The thing that stuck out for us was really people's report of their quality of life with pain. That the Euroqual um, score of about 0.4 uh, is very low indeed. What that, I think, is telling us is that people have got many health problems and that it's on a par with those sorts of conditions, long-term severe neurological conditions and forms of dementia uh, in terms of people's general experience of life, people come to specialist services. One of the things that came out from the audit is the high healthcare use that patients have before they come to a clinic. We found 16% of patients had been to A&Es, which was much higher than we were expecting. After they'd been to service, it dropped down to 9%. Hospital visits are very costly, especially on scheduled care visits. And so that, to me, that really could potentially pay for a service in itself. We were able to address those, uh, those emergency visits. It's very hard to create um, a case of need when the majority of care force is social care and we shouldn't really have the divide that we do. However, pain services will exist within health services and we have to create the um, case of need from within the health needs. If people are frequently uh, attending hospital, that suggests that their needs are not well met and it's expensive because poor quality care costs more. And I think we can have sufficient there to demonstrate we can cover costs. And the other thing is that when I go to my GP, he gets paid for my diabetes but he doesn't get paid for my pain. Absolutely right. It's been a source of quite great frustration, really, um, that we've not been able to get some sort of what's called quality and outcomes framework register for pain. I think that's because it's been very hard to define and set some reasonable quality standards. I'm hoping that the quality standards that we've developed through the National Pain Audit can be highlighted to NICE, and indeed that's what we've recommended to NICE, and that those over time can be incorporated into QOF or, or whatever succeeds QOF in the future. My name's Jean Gaffin and I've been hanging around the pain world for quite some time. I first got interested about 25 years ago, 24 years ago, when I became Chief Executive of Arthritis Care, where I was constantly, constantly, constantly meeting people living with the pain of rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Nobody bothered very much. Then I went to work in the hospice movement where 
dealing with pain was a priority. When I finished that job, I saw an advert for the chair of a patient liaison committee of the Pain Society and I've been hanging around pain ever since, trying to increase understanding of it, increase improved management of it and uh, through the Chronic Pain Policy Coalition uh, get parliamentarians involved so now we've got an all-party group on pain. So a very sort of um, mishmash really of concern and interest. Now we're at the National Pain Audit launch this evening. What were your reactions to it? I think it is an incredibly important piece of work, not just because it's examination of how many pain clinics there are, how few there are really, relative to the need of the population, because they've done this very important research. Nothing new, but just reinforcing much more scientifically perhaps than we've done it before, just what the burden of pain is to people living with chronic pain in terms of work, in terms of quality of life and so on and I gather that there are going to be more statistics coming out from another national survey and I hope in the end we'll build up a real head of steam not easy in the, this world of cuts to try and meet the needs of people living in chronic pain which has been undermanaged for so long. What surprised me was that the people who wrote this report the British Pain Society they had trouble in finding out all these statistics. Where do oh, we patients stand on this? Absolutely. You know, the signposting of services is minimal. You know, I'm, I happen to be a trustee of my local hospice and we had a clinical governance meeting in which two cases were brought to our attention where there was an inappropriate referral to the hospice. These were two patients, not talking about the last weeks of month, or months of life, two patients who were in such pain the GP couldn't know how to cope and there was no pain service that the GP knew about in the area and so they ended up at an outpatient's appointment with our hospice doctor rather than in, in a proper pain service. I'm, I'm sure our doctor dealt with them very well by the way, extremely well I'm sure, but that isn't quite the point because that's not what specialist palliative care should be about, just pain relief. Really. As you've heard, this is just a step on the way now. This is the dissemination of the report, but the next step will be to make sure that it lands on the doormats of those who will hopefully engineer the changes that we need to see. You're really speaking to the converted now, to me, to other members of the British Pain Society, to other people listening to this programme who have persistent pain. What about the people who can really affect our lives, the politicians? What are they going to do about it? Well, I think they need to answer that. We are leaving no stone unturned in terms of trying to access the politicians. We have sent the um, press release to a number of politicians who sit on the chronic pain all-party parliamentary group for chronic pain. We may have the launch uh, this evening and the publication of the report uh, with release by the Department of Health and HQIP this evening and tomorrow. We won't let it rest there and we will be asking questions. We hope there will be some parliamentary questions in the follow-up to the publication of this report. We have indeed sent copies to the Chief Medical Officer and the Medical Director of the NHS in England and the Under Secretary of State for Health. So we hope in that way to continue our lobbying of politicians and policy makers, our contacts in the Department of Health responsible for drafting policy and advising ministers. We hope that through this continuous drip feed of data, information and um, canvassing, lobbying, that we will make our mark and we will improve the experience for future pain patients. I'm Charles Dobson. I work in the Department of Health and among other topics I have currently responsibility for policy on pain. What does that mean? It means advising ministers, it means helping to facilitate those things which will improve pain services for patients. So for instance, uh, I help to secure funding both for the national pain audit we've heard about today and also for the question in the Health Survey for England 2011 on chronic pain. What did you make of the national pain audit review today? I think it's very impressive. It's a, a wonderful piece of work, obviously involved a tremendous amount of effort from everyone involved and it's told us some things we thought we knew already and it's told us some things which perhaps we didn't know before. Like? The very low 
quality of life on average of the patients who responded to the questionnaire and who attend uh, specialist pain services. You're a civil servant, your masters are the ministers. What would they do about it? They have set out a new vision, if you like, of the relation between ministers and the NHS at the coalface through the NHS commissioning board as an intermediary. So in the new landscape, ministers will set very broad priorities and the commissioning board will then decide where they need in particular to take national action. Now, one of the five outcomes in the NHS outcomes framework is improving the quality of life of people with long-term conditions. And all the evidence we have shows that you couldn't possibly do that without in particular helping people with pain and people suffering from musculoskeletal disease. So it seems to me a no-brainer that the NHS Commissioning Board will want to take action on pain and on musculoskeletal disease. And it's very encouraging that they have, within the last few days, uh, advertised that they want to lead within the Commissioning Board with particular responsibility for musculoskeletal disease. So that will address one key component of the pain agenda. That was Charles Dobson of the Department of Health. Now, before we end this edition of Airing Pain, I just need to remind you of our usual words of caution that whilst we believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Don't forget that you can still download all previous editions of Airing Pain from painconcern.org.uk and you can obtain CD copies from Pain Concern. If you'd like to put a question to our panel of experts or just make a comment about these programmes, then please do so via our blog, message board, email, Facebook, Twitter or pen and paper. All the addresses are at our website, which, once again, is painconcern.org.uk. Final words from this launch of the National Pain Audit Final Report go to Professor Richard Langford, President of the British Pain Society, Christine Hughes and Jean Gaffin, who represent patient organisations. What surprises me is how little we actually know about what is available for pain patients out in the big wide world of the British NHS. And I think this is the biggest problem for patients. Information, I think, is, is king and people go to their GP and very often the GP well, one doesn't ask them about their pain and if they do find out about the pain probably is not has not got the kind of knowledge because it is a very specialized area to um, help them with their pain or know where to refer them and because there's so little knowledge out there of the services that you could actually have a, a very specialized pain unit fairly close to that GP and there's a good possibility he won't even know about it so it is about spreading the information of what is available as well as what is good practice in the hope that we can then in this new world of the NHS commission new and better pain services across the country so that there is access for everybody and I think also quick access because undiagnosed pain um, will become chronic and become a disease in its own right. Pain is now uh, listed as a long-term condition in the long-term conditions agenda and so we hope that with all of our efforts at raising the awareness of pain and indeed lobbying policy makers and politicians and now very much commissioners that we will see that pain rises more in the uh, priority list. I'm encouraged and I have been for the last I suppose 15, 16 years by the accumulation of data which hopefully eventually will be powerful enough to influence commissioners. Not quite here yet but I hope we will eventually be able to do that.